Welcome to Human Monsters. Roy Albert DeMeo was born on September 7, 1940, in the Flatlands, Brooklyn district of New York City. His family were working class Italian immigrants originating from the Neapolitan region. His mother was a homemaker and his father was a laundry company delivery man. Roy got started in organized crime early in life, at the age of 19. At this age, he had gotten a start as a loan shark. His training in legitimate work was as an apprentice butcher at a grocery store from the ages of 15 to 22. This background would become an asset to him throughout his career in malfeasance. Roy's immediate family disintegrated at this time. His father died of a heart attack in December 1960. His mother returned to Italy with his youngest brother to live with her family close to Naples. As the 1960s progressed, Roy became more heavily immersed in the world of organized crime. He began as an associate of the Lucchese crime family. Roy worked with the Flatlands Carnarsie wing of the family. The Lucchese's operated tow truck companies, junkyards, and auto theft rings. Roy became acquainted with Anthony Gacci, who was a soldier in the Gambino family. Roy was an effective earner, and Gacci was impressed with his work. Gacci informed DeMeo in 1966 that he would profit more from his activities if he worked directly for the Gambinos. Throughout the late 60s, DeMeo continued to profit from loan sharking in collaboration with Anthony Gacci, while he assembled a crew of younger associates who would help him build up his auto theft syndicate. DeMeo's posse of racketeers would become known both in organized crime circles and law enforcement as the DeMeo Crew. The first to join his crew was Chris Rosenberg, 16 years old. They met when Rosenberg was selling marijuana at a gas station in 1966. DeMeo loaned Rosenberg money so he could sell weed in larger quantities. By 1972, Rosenberg introduced some of his other friends to DeMeo, and they too worked for him. Other members included Joseph and Patrick Testa, Anthony Center, Richard and Frederick Denome, Henry Borelli, DeMeo's cousin, Joseph Dracula Guglielmo, Vida Arena, and Carlo Profeta. Always enterprising, DeMeo joined a credit union in Brooklyn that same year. He obtained a position on the board of directors. He used his position at the credit union to launder the money he earned through his criminal activity. He got colleagues at the credit union involved with a very lucrative side hustle of helping drug dealers launder their money. DeMeo stole money from the credit union to build up his loan sharking business. DeMeo continued to expand his loan sharking enterprise. A dentist office, an abortion clinic, several restaurants, and flea markets all came to DeMeo with their hands out. To establish an air of legitimacy, he was listed as an employee at a Brooklyn company called SNC Sportswear Corporation. He told his neighbors he worked in construction, retail grocery, and used car sales. 1973. Roy DeMeo owned a bar called the Gemini Lounge in Flatlands. He didn't own it on paper but nobody ever disputed his proprietorship. One day he was introduced to a man named Dominic Monteglio. He was the nephew of DeMeo's associate, Nino Gacci. Roy invited Dominic to visit the Gemini. He said, good people there. This was code language well understood by Dominic due to his understanding of the culture of organized crime. His conversations with other wise guys were rich in references that would have been obscure and nearly impenetrable to outsiders. Nino said to Dominic, Roy has a bunch of kids around him, real sleepers. Dominic said, sleepers? They look about 12 years old, but they're tough guys. Nino took Dominic to the Gemini Lounge a few weeks later. Dominic met Chris Rosenberg. 
Roy said he was, quote, a friend in the car business. While Roy and Nino discussed business, Dominic and Rosenberg got better acquainted. Chris said he had been, quote-unquote, with Roy since he was 16 years old. He was now 23 and is, quote, man. Roy was a big-time loan shark, though not as big as your man, Nino. He explained that he borrowed money from Roy at three-quarters of one percent interest. He would loan it to his own customers at three to five points a week. He said many of his customers were mechanics in Canarsie and Flatlands, where he owned an auto repair garage. He said, Need a car? I can get you a good deal on a Lincoln. 1973. Great shape. Dominic wasn't quick to take him up on his offer. He told Nino about the offer on the way home. Nino said, I don't want you to buy a car from Chris. It might be stolen. Chris and his friends deal in stolen cars. It occurred to Dominic that because Chris worked in tandem with Roy and Roy collaborated with Nino, Nino capitalized on the hot car market himself, even if he was only a shareholder in Roy's company. Dominic had lived in California for a time, and Nino was driving his third Cadillac, long a favorite make among mobsters, since Dominic's return. Nino told him he had a friend who would give him a good deal and financing program on a new car. The friend was a loan customer who owned a dealership. Dominic was forced to settle with an Oldsmobile Cutlass. A few weeks later, Nino gave Dominic a $50 pay raise under the proviso that he'd collect weekly payments from a loan customer in Manhattan on Fridays. Dominic would drive to the 21 Club to see Chuck Anderson, who was also known as Mr. New York. Dominic was rising toward the higher echelons of power in the Gambino family. He was nowhere near the point of getting made or becoming a member, but he was respected and invited to events from which a newcomer would have normally been excluded. A change came over him, as manifested in his outward appearance. He ditched his long hair and hippie attire and was clad in a way that was more consistent among the wise guys with whom he was working. As time went on, Nino revealed more and more aspects of the world of organized crime in which he had been immersed. Throughout this process, Nino revealed how dangerous he really was. One night he called Dominic and instructed him to fly to Florida with $20,000. A couple of armed robbers stole all of Nino's cash when he and his wife Rose were at their vacation property. The robbers were under the impression that the house was empty. They rang the bell to make sure. When Rose answered the door, one of the robbers was about to hightail it out of there. The other flashed a gun and pushed his way inside. Shortly thereafter, Nino came to see what the commotion was about. The unarmed robbers said, Let's get the fuck out of here. Nino screamed, Who the fuck are you assholes? The armed robber said, Shut the fuck up. Fuck you, get the fuck out of my house. Nino rushed at the man, but the gunman pistol whipped him in the face and pounded him on top of his head. Nino fell over, dizzy and bleeding. Rose rushed to his side while the robbers searched the house for money and valuables. One look in Nino's eyes as he concluded the recall of this event, and Dominic knew that were Nino to ascertain the identities of the robbers, they were as good as dead. Nino said, Judge a man by his eyes. The eyes don't lie. Dominic didn't question Nino's sincerity. Back in Brooklyn, the bond between the two men grew stronger. Dominic learned that the gotchi ties to organized crime went back generations. Nino recalled his childhood aspirations to become a gangster. Growing up, all I ever wanted was to be like Skrank Scalise and to die on the street with a gun in my hand. Getting murdered, or whacked, as it is commonly referred in mobster parlance, is a well-known consequence of aligning oneself with the Italian mafia. One such murder is frequently referred to as a hit. Nino told Dominic a story about one of his hits. The guy's name was Vincent Squalenti. 
We surprised him in the Bronx. We shot him in the head, stuffed him in the trunk, drove to 10th Street, and threw him in a furnace. Nino couldn't have possibly been more nonchalant in the retelling of the murder of another human being such as a mainstay in mafia culture. Vendettas do not go unavenged. It would be considered strange if you didn't seek revenge. Vincent Squalente was murdered for killing two members of Nino's family. Dominic said, I'm glad you got the cocksucker, indicating he understood this policy very well. One thing that became a regular practice was stopping by the Gemini Lounge on Friday nights. It was at that time that Roy got his crew together to divvy up the money that was accumulated from their dealings. Dominic was greeted with respect because he was accompanied by Nino, but Roy only dealt privately with Nino when it came to business matters. Dominic would drink with the other upstarts. Nino advised Dominic against any long-term association with these types because some of them trafficked narcotics, and Nino was one of the old-school capos who refused to get his hands dirty in the drug business. Besides, Nino wanted to delegate more of the responsibilities he grew tired of dealing with, but didn't want to give up because of their profitability. He wanted Dominic to attend to matters in Florida and to handle more of his loan sharking business. He also wanted him to keep abreast of what was happening amongst their associates. After all, Keeping up with that news can literally be a matter of life or death. Nino notified Dominic that he was grooming him to take his place one day. Nobody in that life starts at the top, so Dominic had a lot of dirty work to do. March 2nd, 1975 While out driving, Dominic spotted Vincent Governero's car parked by a craps game situated next to the Villa Borghese restaurant. He recalled that Nino wanted to whack Garvanera. He drove to Nino's house and told him where Garvanera was. Nino called Roy DeMeo. After receiving the news, he dropped off a concussion grenade at Nino's house. Dominic was a veteran of the Vietnam War. Having had experience with explosives on the battlefield, he was concerned that this grenade might not be adequate for their purpose, since its bombastic energy might escape when Governor opened the door of his car. Addressing his concerns, Nino said, If this is going to bother you, let me know now. You don't have to help. No, I'll do it. Roy DeMeo said, Hey Dom, this ain't no Vietnam. Give me the fucking grenade. 2 a.m. Vincent Governora left the craps game. Roy DeMeo was on his way home. Nino was in bed. Dominic was sitting on his porch. He was trying to figure out how to remove the grenade if it were not detonated as expected. It would be problematic in the morning, since there was an elementary school nearby attended by some 200 children. Governora got into his car. Having gotten comfortable behind the wheel, he had no idea he was sitting directly above a grenade. The fish hooks that were tied to the pin and attached to the door had already been pulled. Unexpectedly, Governor didn't close the door right away. The explosion hit Governor so hard he was ejected from the car and landed across the street. Glass flew everywhere and the car collapsed on itself. The blast did not kill Governora. When he came to, he had a broken leg, but was otherwise unscathed. The younger of Roy DeMeo's followers developed a reverence of Dominic Gacci because of his success in carrying out the hit on Vincent Governora. Dominic was, quote, making his bones, an expression used by the mob when someone commits murder to earn respect and advanced to positions of power. Nino Gacci was also admired for his commitment to vendettas. This, DeMeo appreciated greatly. Christopher Rosenberg eventually became deeply involved in the stolen car syndicate. He opened up a body shop, which eventually became a way station for stolen and chopped cars. He called the business 
Carphobia Repairs. When he joined the DeMeo crew, he brought his best friends, Joseph Testa and Anthony Center. Rosenberg was of Jewish heritage, but he was ashamed of being a Jew and preferred to emulate the Italians he observed in his neighborhood growing up. He was only five foot five and defensive about it. Anybody who dared to comment on it, however, was sure to get a beating and maybe a gun in their face, since at one point he was always packing. Roy DeMeo provided Rosenberg with customers and connections to junkyards. It was there where Chris could obtain the illegal parts he needed. Roy nurtured Chris's burgeoning career in crime and was quick to claim credit for doing so. They even developed a personal friendship with Chris visiting Roy's home and engaging in recreational activities together. It got to the point where he identified as Chris DeMeo. He was like a son to Roy. Joseph Testa and Anthony Center were high school dropouts with a powerful twin-like synergy. They finished each other's sentences and were more or less joined at the hip. They were protective of each other. To offend against one was to incur the wrath of the other. They sold drugs and stole cars. They would rough up anybody who complained of having been victims of violence. One day, when a youth complained to Joey of having been smacked by a teacher for being sarcastic in class, Joey waited outside of the school until the teacher departed and beat him up. Anthony was popular with girls due to his good looks, while Joey was more conventionally good-looking. But what really gave them an edge over the common young man was their association with the DeMeo crew. They came to be known as the Gemini Twins because of the time they spent at the Gemini Lounge. One of Joey's younger brothers, Patrick, or Patty, as he was more commonly known, who was 17 years old at the time, began to tag along. He was also a high school dropout, but he was a talented mechanic who was better at fixing cars than Anthony, Joseph, and even Christopher Rosenberg. They were all charged with crimes as juveniles, but were not given harsh penalties. In 1974, Chris was no longer just selling marijuana and hashish. He had moved on to cocaine and quaaludes. About this time, another major player entered the scene. His name was Henry Borelli. He was a neighbor of Joey Testa and was so close, he even bailed him and Anthony out of jail. Unlike the Gemini twins, Henry was a married father of two girls. He had some involvement with crime, however. He was one of Chris's suppliers of marijuana and hashish. He was envious of their association with Roy DeMeo. Roy organized a sit-down with Joey, Anthony, Chris, and Henry. Former associate Andre Katz had been involved in their operation, but one day, due to a mishandled illegal car part task handled by Rosenberg, the police caught wind of what they were doing and charges were laid. He got his revenge against Chris by shooting him. Rosenberg's face was damaged. Even plastic surgery could not undo the damage, and he grew a beard to hide the scars. Roy said, With what he knows about the cars, he can hurt you. Just kill the fucking guy. What are you afraid of? Just whack him and get rid of the body. No body, no crime. Chris said, I ain't afraid. The asshole ruined my face. Everybody agreed, and nobody was afraid to whack Andre Katz. The problem was, he didn't venture much beyond his home, and when he did, to his father's body shop. After signing his own death warrant by trying to kill Christopher Rosenberg, Andre Katz ratted him out to the police. Roy's man on the inside gave him the news. The tip came from an auto crimes detective from Queens, whose brother worked as a bartender at the Gemini. The cop was a problem gambler, so he was obligated to deliver this information, or as it was called within mafia parlance, a hook. Henry had an attractive female friend with whom he had had sexual relations on occasion. She agreed to lure Andre Katz into their trap by asking him out. Her name was Babette Judith Judy Questall. She was attracted to criminals, having even dated bikers.
I'm Morgan Rector, host of the Human Monsters True Crime Podcast. Do you find life boring within the comfort zone? This is the right show for you. It will test your endurance. The offenders profiled are among the most inhumane. June 12th. Henry picked up Judy at noon in front of her workplace, that being the Bulgarian tourist office on East 42nd Street in Manhattan. She was taken to Andre's body shop in Flatlands. Once in Brooklyn, Judy was dropped off by Andre's shop. Her task was to walk in and ask about a non-existent car. Once inside, she encountered a secretary, though Andre was nearby. The secretary was his fiance. Judy said, I'm looking for a white Porsche that my girlfriend left here to be fixed. The secretary said, We don't have a car like that. Judy feigned disappointment. She insisted they must have the car. Andre hung up his phone and gave her his undivided attention. Andre said, Could I help you? It's my friend's car, a white Porsche. I'm supposed to pick it up. Let me look in the back. Come with me. Andre showed off his Mercedes along the way. She told him it was very nice. Andre said, Maybe the car you're looking for is somewhere else. No, I was told it was here. Well, it obviously isn't. Well, damn, some other friends dropped me off and ought to take a cab. Can I drive you home? It isn't any problem. I'll find my way. Well, why don't we get together sometime? All right, I guess. Do you like to dance? You bet. Well, then, how about tomorrow night? She gave him a phone number with falsified digits and told him her name was Barbara. They planned to meet outside of her apartment building on 37th Street. When Judy returned to the car, she said to Henry, I hope you're just going to talk to him. Henry said, That's all. Judy took the rest of the afternoon off. The men drove her home. Henry and Joey went upstairs with her. She looked on as Henry and Joey blasted their sinuses with a blizzard of cocaine. The next day was Friday the 13th. If Andre were superstitious, he would have been right to expect his worst ever spell of bad luck to befall him on this day. Quite the contrary, he was looking forward to getting laid. He received a call from Barbara to meet her in front of her building at 8.30 p.m. Just as Andre was pulling up in front of Judy's apartment building, where he was about to park by a fire hydrant, a white Lincoln owned by Henry Borella's father showed up. He blocked Andre's car by the curb. Three men got out and surrounded the Mercedes. They opened the doors. They were Joey Testa, Anthony Center, and Chris Rosenberg. Andre got out of his car but did not try to flee. Judy heard someone say, We just want to talk. After some further conversation, one of the men pulled out a rope and lifted Andre's arms above his shoulders. He was aggressively shoved into the Lincoln, whereupon all four men took to the road. Andre was taken to Queens. The plan wasn't to simply whack him. They needed to make him disappear. The favored body disposal method of Roy DeMeo, the former butcher's apprentice, was dismemberment. It was not a common practice in the Mafia. Many found it too distasteful. Most hitmen preferred a headshot. Using what became known as the Gemini method, the corpse would serve as bifurcated evidence, one for the police investigation and the other to reinforce the point that whomever carried out the hit was not to be fucked with. Henry withdrew his cooperation at dismantlement. He said, I'd shoot anybody for you, Roy. But that, no thanks. Roy said, It's just like taking apart a deer. It's only a little weird if you do it while the guy's still alive. Roy bestowed the privilege of killing and dismembering Andre Katz upon Chris. After all, he was the one who was disfigured thanks to Andre's actions. Joey and Anthony restrained Andre, who was trembling with terror by this point. Roy and Henry watched with great interest. Roy took up a butcher knife of considerable length 
and plunged it into Andre's heart six times. The method behind the madness dictated that the faster the heart stops beating, the less bloody the disassembly of the victim would be. Andre slumped to the floor as if he were a Muppet, and Jim Henson pulled his hand out of his ass. Chris Rosenberg was crazed. This dish of revenge was served piping hot. He stabbed Andre's corpse fifteen more times in the back, like he wanted Andre's soul to venture through eternity with that knife lodged in his vertebrae. It was now time for Roy and Joey, who had also been a butcher's apprentice, to show everybody else how to dismember a cadaver in a time-sensitive, efficient, and relatively tidy fashion. Roy was experienced enough in this operation to carry it out without keeping a second set of clothing on hand. He didn't even have to wear an apron. They were nevertheless highly prepared for the job. They were outfitted with boning knives, white butcher coats, and rubber gloves. This was only part of the preparation. Timing was also an important factor. To quote Roy, we have to wait a little bit until the blood gets hard. Once Andre's blood got hard, Roy and Joey removed his clothing. They were stunned to discover that Andre was wearing yellow silken panties. Chris and Anthony laid some garbage bags out on the floor along with some twine. Henry was already feeling queasy. He went outside and acted as a sentry by the back door. Though he normally remained sober while working, Roy broke his own rule so he could take a shot of whiskey as he attended to this grisly job. The others followed suit. Roy began by decapitating Andre. With the troublesome origin of Andre's idea to shoot Chris removed, Roy and Joey moved on to the torso. They sawed off all the limbs. Chris and Anthony wrapped the body parts in garbage bags and tied them up with twine. Chris Rosenberg really knew how to hold a grudge. He grabbed Andre's head and ran it through a machine that was normally used for compacting cardboard. Once Andre Katz's body was butchered and packaged, Henry returned and they all attended to the business of cleaning the facilities a job that required thorough attention to detail. They swept and mopped the floor. They scrubbed the sinks and knives. They wiped the particles of brain from the cardboard compactor. They finished by taking the body parts, Andre's clothes, and the empty whiskey bottle and buried it all underneath some rotting vegetables in a garbage bin in back of the store. This incident became known as the Night of Knives. It was a turning point for this group. They had established their method for body disposal, and it would come in handy in the years to come. They weren't as thorough as they thought. One detail they overlooked was that the garbage left behind by the supermarket in whose facilities they dismantled a man was not picked up during the weekend. It was left to fester for two whole days. It could have befouled the air of its immediate environment. It was also potentially a magnet for carnivorous scavengers. On Sunday, a scavenger, a homeless man to be exact, riffled through the dumpster in search of edible food. At one point, he came upon a package containing what he presumed to be a side of beef. When he unwrapped it nearby, he was stunned when he discovered that the discarded appendage was a specimen of a species with whom he was all too familiar. Out of shock, he dropped it on the ground and ran away. Later, a pedestrian found it and called the police. Police unearthed all the other parts in the garbage bin. The only missing element were the genitalia. They were never found. In briefing officers on the findings, Detective Michael Walsh said, A butcher or someone with knowledge of the anatomy of the human being did this. At the city morgue, chief medical examiner Dr. Dominic DeMeo dictated his findings into a microphone as he conducted the autopsy. One quote, Head is decapitated and flattened into a pancake appearance. 
Andre's remains were identified through dental records. The murder received media coverage. Judy was questioned by police. She felt guilty about her role in Andre's death. She confessed and led police to the homes of Henry and Joey. They were taken into custody. Their cover story to the police was that they were unemployed carpenters. They were thrown in jail and did not make bail. There was not enough evidence in Judy's statement to incriminate Chris and Anthony. Andre's brother Victor kept quiet about the death threats Chris Rosenberg made toward him. He was concerned that the reprisal for ratting him out would lead to another tragedy in his family. Police learned about the association with Roy DeMail, but there was no known evidence linking him to the murder, so he was ruled out as a suspect. Roy's lawyer, Frederick Abrams, provided legal advice to Henry and Joey. Abrams was politically connected and had a father who was a judge. At the Gemini Lounge, Chris Rosenberg bragged to Dominic Gacci about the murder of Andre Katz. Dominic was surprised to hear about the dismemberment. It wasn't a normal practice, but he didn't pass comment on it. Dominic asked, Who got whacked? Some old drug partner of mine. He was going to squeal on us, so we had to get rid of him. Because he broke the rules of engagement, right? You got it. And after I got shot, we made a pact. We weren't going to get in any more fights. And we weren't just going to kill the guy. We were going to make him disappear. Dominic said, I'm glad you guys are on our side. Dominic began to run errands for Roy DeMeo. Like anybody else who earns their living through organized crime, DeMeo was a shady character. But Dominic learned in the fall of 1975 that there was no limit to what Roy DeMeo would do to make a buck. Taking his shadiness to a whole new level, one of DeMeo's hustles involved distributing pornographic films featuring women, animals, and children. Roy even showed off the titles of the films to Dominic. Matter-of-factly, he said, It's 11-year-old kids and people with dogs. Up until then, Dominic was aware that Roy's contacts in his loan sharking business led to a partnership in a bordello that also facilitated peep shows in Bricktown, New Jersey. He didn't know he would stoop so low as to profit from child pornography and bestiality. Roy explained to Dominic that he was buying what he called the sick shit for the sex emporium in Bricktown. He also bought it for so-called asshole customers in Rhode Island. Dominic felt uncomfortable about his involvement in this facet of DeMeo's dealings. DeMeo was able to rationalize it, saying, My business is just buying and selling. He could justify anything to himself if it made him money. Nino was even more uncomfortable than Dominic. When Dominic told him about the child porn and the bestiality, Nino said, I don't want you selling that shit. Just because mobsters are criminals doesn't mean they don't have ethics. Nino was a hypocrite, though. He profited from DeMeo's pornography business. Nino put his foot down when it came to the business of child pornography. Roy protested, saying, but there's a lot of money in this. It's the way the industry is going. We can't stay competitive if we don't deal in it. Nino was a father of four children who were under 14 years of age. He was outraged and declared the matter closed to discussion. Roy said, but Nino, Nino laid down the law. I'm telling you, if you don't stop, you're going to die. Roy was already on thin ice for his increasing involvement in the trafficking of narcotics, which the Gambino bosses forbade. He accepted the money from an associate who was not made, which was even worse. Still, the enormous amounts of money the enterprise brought in allayed any inclination the Dons had to crack down on the operation. It was more profitable and reliable than hijacking trucks and loaning money to people who couldn't or wouldn't always pay it back. Importing 25-pound bales of marijuana from Colombia meant fast money once it reached its destination. 
Nobody got involved with the mafia if they couldn't prove they could earn. And, in that regard, Roy DeMeo was just honoring his mandate. In early 1976, Judy Questall's testimony did not survive the cross-examination of Fred Abrams. With no better evidence to rely upon, Henry Borelli and Joey Testa were acquitted. A gathering was arranged for the celebration of the verdict. It was then that Dominic met a new member of the crew, a man named Peter Lafroskia. Chris introduced him by saying he was, quote, one of the top car guys in New York. Dominic also met Henry that night, and the men would go on to become close friends. One day Dominic received a call from Henry. He said, let's go to the pear tree. I want to talk about a little problem that's come up. The Pear Tree was a bar-slash-restaurant where they met on a regular basis. Once at the Pear Tree, Henry said, I went to Roy and asked him if I could kill Chris. Are you crazy? Why didn't you just ask him if you could kill his son? Henry said the proposal was a mistake on his part. Roy became enraged at the suggestion. To quote Henry, Now Roy says, even if Chris drops dead of a heart attack... He's going to hold me responsible. Henry wanted to kill Chris over money matters. More specifically, it involved Chris's conduct while Henry was in jail. To quote Henry, I spent all that time in jail for Chris. We killed that guy for him. And I sat in the can all that time, and Chris didn't take care of my family. He didn't give my wife or kids any money. It is a well-established tradition in the Mafia that if you're a made man, other members of your crew must take care of your spouse and children financially while you are incarcerated. Dominic tried to dissuade Henry from killing Chris. He argued that with Chris being so short-tempered, he might do something impulsive that would lead to his death. It would be very difficult to talk Henry out of this. He had assisted Roy DeMeo as he carried out a hit. Roy was impressed by that one. As he put it, that Henry, he was ice cold. He never flinched. He's a natural, like Joe DiMaggio. Nino had some unfinished business he wished to resolve. Dominic spotted Vincent Governero's new car. He had just returned after spending a lengthy period in Florida. At a birthday party, Dominic pulled Nino aside and said, Guess who's back in town? Nino, Dominic, and Roy walked down to the basement. While in the basement, they put on disguises, fake mustaches, fedoras, non-prescription glasses, makeup effects, caps, and extra jackets. Dominic was an expert in subterfuge, having learned techniques in the military. Roy didn't adorn a disguise. They took up guns and drove to where Governor's car was parked. Nino gave Dominic a gun with a silencer. He said, You get that one, because you're going to do the work. Fine. Roy said, Hey, Dom, as many people as you killed in Vietnam, 50 or whatever it was, this ain't like that. You've said that before, Roy. You know, it's just like what Michael's brother Sonny said in The Godfather. When Michael's going to kill that cop, and Sonny says... Hey, Michael, this ain't like war, where you're shooting people a hundred yards away. Here you walk up and the brains are going to fly all over you. You're right, Roy. This ain't war. We are going to shoot this motherfucker down, and he doesn't have a fucking slingshot. Governor was playing craps. Dominic, Nino, and Roy were impatiently waiting. The tension they all felt mounted. Roy prodded Dominic some more. This is real war, Dom. Real war. Are you ready? Dominic grew irritable due to the pressure. Fuck you, Roy. Fuck you and the pig you rode in on. Take it easy, soldier. Take it easy. No need for insults. Nino couldn't take it anymore. Shut the fuck up. Here he comes. Finally, Governor walked to his car. Contradicting his orders from before, Nino decided to carry out the hit himself. 
He told Dominic to stay across the street and back him up in the event that Governor was packing. After all, Governor must have known through his own connections that there was still a hit to be instigated. Returning to the old neighborhood took guts, considering that he was living on borrowed time. Dominic was relieved to be demoted during this mission. Nino and Roy drew their pistols and walked onto the street. Governor only saw them after reaching his car door. He started running. They shot at him with about 20 pedestrians as witnesses. Nino shouted, Get down! to the crowd on the sidewalk. Governor ran too fast for them and got away. Nino said, Where is the fuck, Roy? A block ahead. How can that cocksucker run so fast? He's a dog, a fucking bunny rabbit. The men got into Roy's car and pursued Governera. They never found him and were forced to give up the pursuit for the time being. They drove to Manhattan, where they disposed of their disguises and tossed their guns in the East River. A month later, Nino was thirsty for revenge once again. A leader of another mafia family told him that two armed robbers in Florida were overheard boasting that an electrician informed them that a big shot from New York likely kept a large cash hoard in his winter home. Though it was the robbers Nino had wanted to kill, he now shifted his vindictive rage toward the contractor. Nino Roy and a Gambino soldier who was based in Florida collaborated to carry out the hit and the disposal of the body. Roy contacted the electrician under an assumed name. He told him he was having a new home built and requested that he examine the blueprints and provide him with an estimate for his services. After this meeting, the electrician, George Byram, agreed to have a second meeting in the Ocean Shore Motel, located just outside of Miami. Immediately after entering the room, Byram was shot in the buttocks. Roy shot him several more times until he was dead. Nino and the Gambino soldier had been hiding in the bathroom. They dragged the corpse to the bathtub and then waited for the blood to congeal. Byram was a civilian, so there was a very pressing need to make him disappear. They agreed to carry out his body parts in suitcases. While Roy was sawing off Byram's head, the Gambino soldier heard construction sounds coming from outside. He insisted they leave the motel, and they did. July 14, 1976. A maid discovered the partially decapitated body of George Byram. She was so traumatized, she underwent psychotherapy. There were no clues linking the murder to the culprits, and the case went as cold as Byram's corpse. A sea change occurred when Carlo Gambino, the boss of the Gambino family, passed away. Paul Castellano took his place and made a lot of changes. With Castellano at the helm, Roy DeMeo's hopes for getting made were dashed. Big Polly, as Castellano was often called, didn't want further involvement with so-called blue-collar crime, like truck hijackings and auto theft. He preferred to get involved with more legitimate enterprises, like unions and construction. The impact these crimes made on the community were largely invisible and attracted less attention from the police. Meanwhile, Nino Gachi was made a capo. Nino promised he would talk to Paul about it, but Paul had made up his mind. Nino was the underboss of the Brooklyn faction, and there was little to nothing for him to gain from his association with Roy DeMeo. It was not in DeMeo's best interest to get made anyway. If Paul Castellano had known about half the activities he was involved with, he likely would have been whacked. Meanwhile, the FBI had created a file on all the principals, and it was getting thicker by the day. Roy became aware of their surveillance, and it became increasingly nettlesome, but not as much as Paul's refusal to make him. He knew Paul looked down upon him, Paul sure didn't mind the money Roy paid as tribute, though. Roy came up with an idea of how to win Paul over. He would outdo himself. He would earn so much money, Paul couldn't resist making him. Whilst brainstorming in pursuit of a new scheme, 
An associate named Danny Grillo introduced him to an option that was sure to suit anybody who was anxious to beef up their pocketbook. Grillo met James Coonan, who held a grudge against the leader of the West Side Gang, also known as the Westies. They were an Irish-American outfit. The only thing stopping him from taking over was the problem of being underfunded. Danny told Roy that if they could take over the Westies, they could become a force to be reckoned with, since the Westies often vied with the Gambino crew over the criminal activities in Brooklyn, though they were based in Hell's Kitchen. Roy agreed to provide financing to Coonan. He lent him $50,000 so Coonan could start his own loan sharking operation. They also collaborated on truck hijackings. Their partnership soon paid off, with mutual goals and reciprocation bringing in money and power. Roy even agreed to whack Mickey Spillane, no relation to the author, who had been the leader of the Westies. He had smacked Coonan's brother around, and the act was never forgiven. This murder occurred on another Friday the 13th. Roy hid behind a staircase in the apartment building located in Queens, where Spillane was living. Spillane was duped into thinking that Danny Grillo just wanted to speak with him. Grillo rang the doorbell. When Spillane walked out of the door, Roy ambushed him from behind, and both he and Danny shot Spillane with guns, each outfitted with silencers. They didn't succeed in killing him, and Spillane ran out of the building. They chased him out onto the street and shot him several more times. Splane was left to die out on the street so that everybody would know that Jimmy Coonan had gotten his revenge. Coonan also whacked one Ruby Stein, who had been a loan shark. Coonan grabbed his book. He used it to transfer the debts to him. Roy was not consulted, much to his chagrin. Coonan and some of his followers dismembered Stein. The body parts were packed in garbage bags, which were tossed into the East River. Before long, Coonan became the leader of the Westies. He had made his bones, and everybody was well advised to defer to him before their own were disassembled. He notified everyone about his connections to the Italian Mafia, which further consolidated his power and influence. Roy was pleased by this and notified Nino that Roy would get 10% of everything Coonan brought in. Nino promised to deliver the news to Paul. Paul was impressed. He realized Roy was no longer dispensable, not with all the new money rolling in. Roy was finally being made. Though he was now elevated in status, he didn't resign from the blue-collar crimes for which he was best known. A chop shop operator by the name of Johnny Quinn became a thorn in Roy DeMeo's side. He had testified before grand jury, which was the unforgivable sin of being a rat. As if that weren't bad enough, he employed his girlfriend, Sherry Golden, who was working on the clerical end of his business, which was directly tied to Roy DeMeo's business. DeMeo wasn't nearly as trusting, and considering he was a newly made man, he was keen to show how such an offense would not be tolerated. Quinn was whacked at the Gemini Lounge. Sherry was waiting outside. While sitting in the car, Sherry was distracted by Joey Testa and Anthony Center, who stood on either side talking to her. While her attention was directed towards Joey, Anthony shot her in the head twice. Anthony concluded the hit by shooting her in the face. Though Roy wouldn't be so cavalier as to keep the bodies on the premises of the Gemini or any other of the properties where he conducted his business affairs, he still wanted them to be discoverable. DeMeo's men disposed of Quinn's body along a road on Staten Island that got very little traffic. Sherry's body was left positioned against the underside of the dashboard, resembling the contortion of a rag doll. She was covered with some clothes that had been stored in the trunk. Someone pulled her halter top down, exposing her breasts. The reasoning behind this action was that it might lead the police to believe that it was a sex crime. Quinn's body was found the evening of the day his remains were dumped. Sherry's body wasn't found for three days. After receiving a report about a possibly stolen car, 
An officer investigated the vehicle on July 24, 1977. What he found was a dead passenger when he detected the rotten egg-like odor of a decomposing human body. The murders received coverage in the media, a point of frustration for Paul Castellano. One thing he hated about Roy DeMail was his unpredictability. He could be relied upon to earn at the level of a made man, but while hits were never going to be phased out as a necessary evil of doing his kind of business, Paul wanted discretion. Leaving bodies in cars and alongside deserted roads didn't exactly establish a low profile. The Don has to answer for the activities of his family whenever the feds and police come sniffing around. Roy DeMeo was beginning to become a liability. Paul Castellano didn't know about these hits yet, but Nino Gachi did, and he was furious at Roy. Nino said, you can't just be running around doing this cowboy stuff. The way Roy saw it, he was just enforcing the rules of La Costra Nostra, or our thing. He said, Quinn already talked. She knew it. She had to go too. But you can't go around killing everybody you feel you have to kill without talking to me. I'm telling you, she was part of his operation. She could have hurt us bad as him. Polly ain't going to like this. Nino had to sit down with Paul the next day. Paul had already suspected Roy DeMail was responsible for the hits. The papers mentioned that Quinn was a leader of a car theft ring, which tipped Paul off. Paul said, Why did the girl have to be killed? Nino said, She was part of his operation. She might have been talking. She had to go. Nino was only making this argument because of the consequences of conceding that he couldn't control Roy. Castellano was diplomatic. He said, Make sure people don't just start going who don't have to go. It turned out he wasn't managing his power as effectively as expected. Someone in his position had to be prepared to, quote, break balls, as the wise guys often put it. The night before Sherry's body was found marked an event that one might normally see in a Marx Brothers or Three Stooges short. The police were called to a banquet hall. A catered event was underway to celebrate Anthony Center's wedding, with many wise guys and their underlings settling down to dinner. The servers were low-level mafia upstarts, who were nonplussed at having to act as waiters. One of the reasons they chose the gangster lifestyle was that they wanted to avoid being treated like chumps, a typical experience when working in customer service. The waiters were surly and cavalier with the food they were dispensing. Some of them were downright rude. At one point, an entry-level flunky placed a plate in front of Roy DeMeo in a way that DeMeo deemed careless. He interpreted it as a critical show of disrespect. He was a made man, and he resented that the quality of the service provided hadn't transcended what one would expect at McDonald's. DeMeo said, What's wrong with you? Don't you know how to serve people? Doing the best I can, pal. Do you know who you're talking to? Don't know. Don't care, buddy. This was more than Roy could abide. He stood and smacked the waiter in the face as hard as he could. Some of the other servers rushed to the waiter's aid. Everybody else became involved, and it became a full-scale riot. Danny Grillo threw a waiter out a window. Henry Borelli didn't fare so well. He was beaten severely. Dominic avenged his defeat, punching a waiter so hard that Roy marveled at its execution. As Roy put it, I felt the force go by. Roy was paying thousands and thousands of dollars in tribute to Nino and Castellano, so while DeMeo's grisly murders were discouraged, they were never forbidden. DeMeo expanded the numbers of his crew, and eventually the hits were no longer carried out strictly for policy transgressions and personal vendettas. DeMeo's outfit was also now a murder-for-hire business. They were good at killing and equally talented at making corpses disappear. Over the next 18 months, the remains of seven victims linked to DeMeo were found. They were all dismembered and thrown in with the garbage at the Fountain Avenue dump. 
Anthony Center's uncle owned a sanitation company, and they employed his connections to use the dump as an ad hoc cemetery. Roy gifted Chris, Joey, and Anthony with sets of high-end carving knives. Roy called them tool kits. This wasn't one of his better ideas. Their lives were snow globes of cocaine addiction. When it wasn't going up, they were crashing down. Anger and blunt metal instruments react to cocaine like fire reacts to gasoline. To be fair, Roy was only aware that they were selling coke. He was naive to believe that you can trust criminals. They break rules for a living. It's what they do. While Chris, Joey, and Anthony became expert at dismembering corpses, Henry became a crack shot. They even dubbed him Dirty Henry. Henry forgave Chris for not helping support his family while he was in jail. This was exceptional. Forgiveness is rare among wise guys. Throughout the 1977 to 1978 corridor, the bodies were piling up relentlessly. Anyone cocky enough to threaten the crew or obstruct their ability to do business was exterminated like vermin. They even whacked two men who assisted with the hijacking because DeMeo deemed them to be too weak to hold up during a police interrogation. Patrick Presenzano had a lot of balls. He stole jewelry from someone Roy knew. Not only did he deny that he stole it, but he continued to wear it. Roy shot him, slit his throat, and left him in a car. To create the illusion of a sex crime, his pants and underwear were pulled down to his ankles. Michael Mantellino and Nino Martini were suspected of informing two robbers that associate Peter Lafroskia always kept a hoard of money, jewelry, and cocaine in his house. They robbed him, but the DeMeo crew found Mantellino at the body shop he managed. They shot him and Martini, who only rode along with him in the car. The DeMeo crew set fire to the body shop. Kevin Guelli did something really stupid. After boasting to Chris Rosenberg that he knew a lot of people to whom he could sell cocaine, Rosenberg gave him $10,000 worth of white on consignment. When Chris approached him to collect, Guelli claimed that someone broke into his house and stole the coke. Chris said, Sure. He shot and killed him. Gary Gardeen pulled a similar stunt. He was issued three pounds of marijuana by Chris and never paid it back. Chris shot him, put him in the trunk of his car, and set it on fire. When newspaper reporters wrote about these incidents, they would use a phrase like, apparently the work of professional hitmen. This was amusing to the DeMeo crew. They would jokingly greet each other by saying something like, Hello, and how are you today, Mr. Professional Hitman? The deal DeMeo made bridging his interests between the Westies and the Gambinos nearly backfired. The consequences were minimal since Nino and Paul were still profiting significantly from DeMeo's activities. It all began when the torso washed ashore on a beach in Brooklyn. It had been in the water for several months. It was identified as having once been the property of Ruby Stein. The Westies' tradition of puncturing the stomach and lungs so that they would be saturated with water and therefore cause the body to sink due to the added weight was not observed. This was a problem for Roy because a boss in another mafia family was a key investor in Stein's book. If anybody found out the Westies and the DeMeo crew were responsible for the murder, that boss would complain to Paul Castellano. The Gambinos would have been obligated to reimburse him. If you cause a boss to lose money, you lose your life. Paul conducted an inquiry to resolve the issue to prevent reprisals and an all-out war. He told Nino to tell Roy to summon Jimmy Coonan to a sit-down at Tommaso's. The solution was to order the so-called Irish kids and Roy DeMeo to reimburse the boss. The next step was for Roy to sever ties with the Westies. The 10% of the Westies' action wouldn't have been much of a loss anyway. Roy was frustrated by the actions of the Westies, but he wanted to retain his association. There was nothing he wouldn't do to make a buck, 
and that included contradicting the boss. He emphasized the money the Westies and the Gambinos could be making in collaboration. Paul didn't really need the money. He was profiting extraordinarily well from the Gambinos' interests. Roy denied that his Westies associates were involved with the murder. His take in that situation was that it was a necessary evil because the Westies could not dominate the loan sharking business on the West side. Naturally, large grosses of cash would find their way into the Gambino's coffers. Roy and the Westies would compensate the boss who lost his portion of the business. Paul and Nino were skeptical about Roy's proposals, but the promise of increasing profits sweetened the deal considerably. Nino established the Gambino crew's policy when it came to hits. As he addressed Jimmy Coonan directly, he said, Anytime there is a problem with somebody, before anybody gets killed, you've got to get our okay, so we can make sure it isn't one of our people. You can't go around acting like cowboys. Paul granted the Westies money at 1% interest per week. This was a common rate among family members. The 10% rule for everyone else remained. Roy was designated the Westies' official contact in the Gambino family. Roy reported to Nino, but Nino was in Florida so often that Roy became a de facto supervisor. Dominic Gacci also attended the sit-down. He said to Coonan's associate, Mickey Featherstone, Were their families together like this? We will fucking take over New York. The DeMeo crew's first murder-for-hire victim was Michael DiCarlo, also known as Mikey Muscles, because he was a champion bodybuilder. He was also an errand boy for a capo of the Lucchese family. He molested a boy whose parents were connected well enough to the Lucchese's to know how to seek justice. After he was killed, he was dismembered in an after-hours club in Flatlands. Dracula Guglielmo was gleeful about this mission, Boasting afterwards, I shoved a broomstick up his ass. In retelling the story, Roy DeMeo offered up the graphic details. We thought the guy was dead, but when we went to take off his fucking head, he reaches up and grabs me by the fucking neck, but Anthony finished him off with a hammer. Satisfied that his crew could wipe out anybody when the price was right, Roy DeMeo announced to capos of all the New York families that his operation was a modern-day equivalent of Murder, Inc. They charged $5,000 for the murder of Mikey Muscles. This was a bargain, and with all the capos looking to save money, they expected to be flush with business. Danny Grillo was being investigated by law enforcement and the DeMeo crew did not have faith that he would remain loyal and keep his mouth shut. Dominic was hoping he could talk Roy out of it. He went to the Gemini on November 15, 1978, for this purpose. He was a day too late. The so-called Gemini twins, along with Chris Rosenberg, had already cleaned their knives and put their toolkits back into the trunks of their cars. Dominic said to Chris, "'Have you seen Danny?' Chris said, Nobody will see Danny no more. Dominic was thrown by the fact that they could not only kill a friend, but do it in such a grisly fashion. He stared at Chris as he contemplated this. Chris said, If you could have seen the way we took Danny, he went like a sucker. Dominic fantasized about retaliating, but there would have been severe repercussions. Dominic went into the lounge to ask Roy about what happened. Roy was smirking as he said, Danny's car was found on the bridge last night, but if anybody wants to talk to him, they'll have to talk to him at the Fountain Avenue dump. We committed him suicide. Danny hoped that his body would be discoverable so his wife and children could collect on his life insurance policy. Because he wasn't found, they were left destitute. Before 1979 drew to a close, the DeMeo crew was a murder factory, churning out the corpses of anybody who broke the rules. It was an everyday fact of life to Roy DeMeo, who didn't bat an eyelash when he passed by a cadaver, 
as he remarked to crew member Vito Arena after they passed by two naked bodies of victims hanging upside down in the bathroom. Those are a favor for someone in Manhattan. The victims were never identified since they were dismembered and buried. Murder was so exhilarating to the DeMeo crew, it became as addictive to them as cocaine. The younger members compared killing to getting high. Roy was more grandiose, saying it was like having the power of God. The executions became more ritualistic. The dismemberments were carried out in the Gemini Clubhouse apartment where Joe Dracula lived. The protocol by this point was that the victim was shot in the head, stabbed in the heart to stop the blood flow, hung upside down over the bathtub so the blood would drain and congeal, laid out on a tarp, sawed apart, packaged, and dumped. Either Roy or Henry would do the shooting. Chris did the stabbing. The rest of the others handled the dismemberment, though Roy, Chris, and Dracula would offer their assistance when needed. Hence, the infamous Gemini method. Anybody who is feared to be capable of ratting Roy or his associates out, or who existed as a roadblock to making money, was wiped out. Roy DeMeo was forced to kill Chris, who had become too trigger-happy. He was out of control, and it threatened to create serious problems for the Gambino family. This followed a trip to Florida, where he made a large drug deal with a Cuban man who was connected to a cartel. When the Cubans flew to New York to close the sale, Rosenberg murdered them. There was potential of a war between the cartel and the Gambino crew, so Roy DeMeo agreed to whack Chris to prevent this from happening. The Cubans demanded that the murder make the papers, so Chris's corpse had to be discoverable. This was the only murder about which DeMeo felt remorse, since he and Rosenberg had been so close. Though the FBI and police were relentless in their surveillance and pursuit of evidence in the DeMeo file, they got a lucky break in the form of a telephone call from an anonymous person who informed Detective Frank Pergola that a, quote, gangster named Roy DeMeo was involved with Chris Rosenberg's murder. Further into 1979, the bloodbath grew to a tidal wave. Joey Testa replaced Chris Rosenberg as Roy DeMeo's right-hand man. Henry Borelli was disappointed by this, but Roy made it up to him by elevating his status in an operation that sold cars to customers in Kuwait. Jimmy Eppolito was fouling up hardcore. He defrauded a charity that involved the donations and personal appearances of major celebrities, including the First Lady Rosalind Carter. Paul Castellano feared that this might result in the President dispatching thousands more FBI agents to New York to crack down on the Gambino family for good. Roy DeMeo whacked both Jimmy and his father in the middle of a road trip. DeMeo, Nino Gacci, and Peter Piacente fled the scene. Unfortunately for them, a motorist by the name of Patrick Penny witnessed the incident. Though he was also a career criminal, he decided to do the right thing. When a police car came along, he ran up and reported what he saw to the officer. The officer caught up with the men a few blocks away. When he drew his gun and ordered them to freeze and put their hands up, Nino opened fire. He shot three times and missed. Officer Roder shot him three times back. He landed one shot on his neck. Bianchente caught a bullet in his leg and started hobbling away. Nino collapsed onto the ground. He reached for his pistol. Roder told him to stop, but Nino kept reaching. Nino was getting close to realizing his dream to die like Frank Scalise in the street with a pistol in his hand. He grasped the butt of the gun. Raider shouted, Don't touch it or I'll shoot again. Nino held on to the pistol, but he lost so much blood he was too weak to raise his arm. Becoming lightheaded, he let the gun go and lay still. Peter Piacente was taken into custody while still hobbling a block away. 
Nino Gachi recovered in hospital. As it turned out, the bullet wound was superficial. He was transferred to a prison hospital in Rikers Island. He had been charged with murder and the attempted murder of a police officer. Due to jury tampering, he was charged only with assault. He was issued a 5-15 to 15 year sentence in federal prison. After Gachi was sentenced in March 1980, Roy DeMail murdered Patrick Penny. Roy DeMail's ideas were more impractical, bizarre, and unrealistic than ever. He wanted to assassinate Roeder, the arresting officer. This idea was rejected. Killing police officers was something no wise guy, not even a boss, would do. The publicity and attention from law enforcement had the potential to wipe out any family. As far as Nino's incarceration, he said, We'll get some scuba gear and sneak up on Rikers and take the hospital with machine guns. Roy must have seen too many movies. Dominic was dumbfounded. He said, That's the stupidest James Bond bullshit I ever heard. If you ever tried to stunt like that, I guarantee it. My uncle would not leave with you. He'd shoot you if he could. Patrick Penny was murdered by the DeMail crew and it was portrayed in the local media as a mob hit. After a lengthy period of surveillance, the FBI obtained a search warrant for the Empire Boulevard building, where much of the stolen car ring business was conducted. Henry Borelli and Frederick Denome were arrested in May of 1981 for their involvement. There wasn't sufficient evidence to arrest any other of the parties who were alleged to have participated. DeMeo ordered Borelli and Denome to plead guilty to the charges. His assumption was that it would prevent further FBI and police investigations into his activities. When 1982 rolled around, the FBI were investigating the case of all the missing and murdered people whose executions were said to be linked to Roy DeMeo. The Bureau placed a bug in the home of Gambino capo Angelo Ruggiero. They listened in on a conversation he had with Gene Gotti, brother of John Gotti. They discussed the fact that Paul Castellano was fed up with Roy DeMeo and ordered a hit on him. The problem was, he had difficulty finding someone who was up to the task. DeMeo was surrounded with cold-blooded, ruthless killers. John Gotti was said to have killed less than ten people. Roy DeMeo's body count was rumored to number at a minimum of 37. According to Sammy the Bull Gravano, famous for being the rat who turned against John Gotti, Frank DeChico was given the contract. He and his crew could also not get access to DeMeo long enough to snuff him. The only solution left was to find a way to hire one of DeMeo's men. According to Albert DeMeo, Roy's son, it wasn't long before his death that Roy became paranoid. He knew he was going to be murdered any day. He wore a leather jacket with a shotgun concealed within. Roy contemplated faking his own death by having his son shoot him strategically in a way that would avoid fatal injuries and then go on the lam. January 10, 1983, DeMeo went to the home of associate Patty Testa, for a meeting with his crew. That evening he was a no-show for his daughter's birthday. This was not consistent with his customary behavior, and his family became suspicious. Albert was puzzled to find many of Roy's personal valuables, such as his watch, wallet, ring, and a Catholic pamphlet, in his study. January 20th. Roy DeMeo's Cadillac was found in the parking lot of the Varuna Boat Club in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. It was towed to a police station and searched by detectives operating as part of the Organized Crime Control Bureau. DeMeo's body was found in the trunk. It was partially frozen. It was weighted down with a chandelier. He didn't die from drowning. He was shot several times in the head. He was also shot in the hand. In April 1984, Colombo crime family soldier Ralph Scopo was heard telling an associate that DeMeo was murdered by his own family because they suspected he would not be able to withstand legal charges he was being slapped with due to his stolen car ring. 
Albert de Mayo has also remarked that he believed his father was killed by his own crew. In 1984, 78 indictments were filed against 24 defendants. Nino Gacci and Paul Castellano were included. The charges were related primarily to auto theft, racketeering, and the trafficking of narcotics. Castellano was indicted for ordering the hit on De Mayo, along with unrelated charges. He was whacked while out on bail in December 1985. John Gotti ordered this hit, and he became the new boss of the Gambino family immediately after. After Castellano's death, Nino Gacci became the lead defendant in the trial, but he died of natural causes before it was concluded. March 1986. Six defendants were found guilty. Henry Borelli and another defendant were found guilty of two counts of murder. They killed two people who had threatened to expose the auto theft syndicate. June 1989. Nine other DeMail associates, Anthony Center and Joseph Testa among them, were found guilty. They were both given life sentences for murder, with an additional 20 years for racketeering. Prosecutor William Mack Jr. proclaimed, The Roy DeMeo crew is the most violent crew ever prosecuted in federal court, as far as my knowledge. They engaged in wholesale slaughter. The indictments and convictions were made possible for the most part because of the testimony of former members Frederick de Nome, Dominic Monteglio, and Vito Arena. Monteglio flipped when he found out a contract on his life was ordered. He was placed in the witness protection program for 20 years after his testimony. Richard de Nome was murdered in 1984. Frederick de Nome committed suicide. Vito Arena moved out of New York City in 1989 after serving six of an 18-year sentence after he testified. He was murdered during a robbery in Texas in 1991. The Gemini Lounge was later converted to a storefront church. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.